Across the globe and throughout history, plants have been used by humans as a source of medicine and natural remedies. The World Health Organization defines traditional medicine as the knowledge, skills and practices based on the theories, beliefs and experiences indigenous to different cultures used in the maintenance of health and in the prevention, diagnosis, improvement or treatment of physical and mental illness. apprenticeship. <laughs> Traditional medicine continues to be of great importance to all human beings. In the developing world over 80% of the population still relies on medicinal plants as their primary source of health care. Even in the modern Western pharmaceutical industry, traditional medicine still plays a key role for drug discovery. For instance, nearly 50% of all drugs that are currently FDA approved in the US are derived directly or indirectly from natural sources. Here, the science of ethnopharmacology seeks to investigate the medicinal use of plants, animals, macrofungi, microorganisms and minerals through pharmacological, sociocultural and anthropological methods. Ethnopharmacology is a highly interdisciplinary field of research, encompassing field studies such as ethnobotanical studies in local communities, interviews, surveys and the first-time documentation of medicinal use, ritual use or religious aspects. The pharmacological assessment of recorded and collected medicinal species in a laboratory setting, so-called bioactivity studies, and drug discovery of pharmacologically active natural products via pharmacognostic approaches. These activities may be expanded to include community work, as we believe ethnopharmacologists should also act as advocates for the respective indigenous communities with whom they collaborate. Throughout history, the intellectual property rights of indigenous peoples have not been recognized and questions concerning the ownership of biodiversity following the development and commercialization of pharmaceuticals have arisen. The Nagoya Protocol and the Convention on Biological Diversity provided international agreements on financial benefit sharing and recognized each nation's sovereignty over the biodiversity resources within its borders. But what about non-financial benefits? What about the transfer of knowledge in both directions? Unfortunately, even today, ethnopharmacologists rarely return to the local communities after a study has been completed and published. Thus, the successful collection of plant samples and ethnopharmacological information from traditional healers and other community members often marks the end point of this one-sided collaboration, despite the fact that this data will still be analyzed, interpreted and published. Laboratory studies may follow, leading to unique significant discoveries that would certainly be of interest to the local study participants and could even empower them locally while fostering an equal partnership. It's, it's like a cycle. We are back at the beginning with the healers. If the scientists ever return, then in many cases it's only because of an entirely new study, aimed at extracting new information for their research. 
We believe that ethnopharmacologists therefore have the great responsibility of keeping this collaboration and the communication with their local informants bi-directional. Information and knowledge should be shared, creating a benefit for both the scientists and the local study participants. In this video article, we would like to introduce a method for transferring the results of laboratory analysis and ethnobotanical surveys back to traditional healers. Our approach is based on a two-day workshop using our previous studies from the Greater Mpiji region in Uganda as an example. These are the, the places where you, you're living, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that this, this for instance, would be Bunjako Island. Aha, island Because you need you need a canoe to get there, A total of 16 medicinal plant species were investigated as part of an ethnobotanical survey among 39 traditional healers from the Great Ampiji region. This past study has recently been published in the Journal of Ethnopharmacology. Traditional healers from 29 different villages, including one from a very small island in Lake Victoria, were interviewed. The study involved the first-time documentation of preparation and administration methods and the identification of a total of 75 medicinal disorders that are treated with these medicinal plants. In this study, information was obtained using questionnaires that were specifically designed to collect in-depth data on each species. In another follow-up study that was published, we applied the degrees of publication DOP method as a novel tool for literature assessment in ethnopharmacological research. There are numerous field assessment tools in use today. However, none of these tools are able to help researchers determine which species merit the coastly lab studies that would be required for their further investigation, for example, pharmacological assays and the isolation of bioactive natural product compounds. The introduction of the DOP method has filled this gap. In the context of the aforementioned ethnobotanical survey, the DOP method made it possible to classify six of the 16 medicinal plant species as highly understudied and three as understudied. At the Makarere University Herbarium, taxonomic identification was accomplished based on the herbarium voucher specimens that were prepared during fieldwork. Following the fieldwork activities, samples of all 16 plant species were taken to the laboratory where extracts were produced. Various pharmacological investigations followed on the basis of the use reports provided by the traditional healers. These included antimalarial, antibacterial and anti-inflammatory bioassays, among others. These unique investigations led to a large number of interesting results. During our fieldwork, we explicitly asked the 39 healers about their motivation for collaborating with us. The specific questions that we asked were, what are your future expectations from our scientific findings and what do you expect from us researchers? Participants were invited to give multiple responses. Their answers were fascinating. Despite the fact that these traditional healers live in relatively poor circumstances, only 5% stated that they would like to benefit financially from the scientific information gained. On the contrary, there was a high demand for feedback on the results of the survey and the laboratory studies, which we regard as the transfer of knowledge. The majority of the traditional healers said they would like to improve and continue their collaboration with us researchers. 9% were interested in a collaboration for improving their treatment of patients and 11% wanted to strengthen their collaboration with us. The second most common expectation was to receive feedback on the findings of the pharmacological studies that followed the fieldwork. In addition, more than a quarter of the traditional healers mentioned that they would be interested in finding out whether scientific evidence could be found for the claimed medicinal properties of the investigated plants, as such evidence would boost their confidence in the respective treatments. Their responses indicated that there is a vital need for feedback from ethnopharmacologists after a study is completed, as well as a strong interest in continued collaboration and participation in the research. The results of the laboratory work and ethnobotanical survey were shared with the traditional healers through a two-day workshop in November of 2019. All the traditional healers who had initially participated in the field study were invited to the workshop. 
In order to contact them again, we use the network of the NGO Prometra Uganda. Together with Prometra, we organize transport and food. The workshop took place in the local Prometra headquarter in Bujija Buvama sub-county, which is part of the Greater Mpiji region. Written and form consent for the filming and publishing of the video footage was requested and obtained from all participants shown in this video article. One of the possible reasons why so few scientific findings are transferred back to indigenous peoples and traditional healers is that scientific articles are often incomprehensible and inaccessible to them. Therefore, the major challenge was to explain the scientific results in a way that was appropriate to their level of understanding. Western researchers faced the same challenge in the context of scientific outreach activities among the general public in their home countries. However, when such outreach activities are organized in other countries, there should be an emphasis on cultural appropriateness. <laughs> Our strategy for conveying complicated scientific results was to explain the essays and results figuratively and in a simplified manner using everyday examples. In Germany, there were many traditional healers. But with Germany, this knowledge is very important because it's important for health and it can't just be lost. Yet, I'm a example. There's one product that is also known to some people and sold on some markets. And it's a tea to treat the flu. So I need somebody that speaks good German. I have an omu, while you get a whole German. It's a whole German. Yeah, I'm going to go Another challenge was the local language Luganda, which is why multiple translators were present at the workshop. The workshop was divided into three parts. The results from each of the three parts of the workshop are presented separately in the video article as video impressions. Day 1, morning. Transfer of results in a classroom setting using a laptop and a projector. First of all, thank you very much for coming to this workshop. It's really nice. Yeah, and uh, my name is Fabian Schulz. I'm a super ethno-pharmacologist. And I am working at two universities, the Technical University of Berlin, which is in Germany. And the Nuremberg University of Applied Sciences is also in Germany. My wife Inke and me, we work a lot in the Lavengo district with um, a charity called Avodevo. And so we implement scientific projects and charity projects there. This is me working in a laboratory, in a chemistry lab, laboratory in Germany. I'm in Germany for your age, fun and cheap job, more like what we're going to do. Now, we're after asking the workshop participants for permission to film, one of the traditional healers asked us how the video will benefit them. And I think that most researchers that conduct these studies, they never come back to the traditional healers to give, the, to give them the results of the studies. Other researchers like me will see this and it's more like a role model of a transfer of results back. 
So these traditions might not directly benefit, but traditional healers in general in Uganda and in whole of Africa <coughs> that other researchers will do it too. Chino Chiwa Echokula Bilako. Chicken no quit your kula bilako. Anybody such as a Chiambe, but traditional healers in that day. Never let you write. If you have gained a move, a Korea in a day wait. After all the participants introduced themselves and we got permission to film the workshop, we started the program. During the first part, we presented the outcome of the initial survey questionnaire. I was thinking about Uganda, but we also had some Bakiga, two uh, Banyan Kola, mm -hmm. one Bagmere, and one Banyar Banya Wanda. Why more Abaganda, Rivasmos, Ogun, Ogunji, Abachiga, Abanyan Kore, Abakwe, Navawan, Yawada, Umquere, 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 after that, we explained how the study continued. But all of the plants were mentioned by some of you to be used against in treatment of malaria. So we look for plant, plants that can inhibit and destroy the processes that are taking place in here caused by the pathogen. And many, many medicines, like Western medicines, like the drug chloroquine, they do the same. So we are looking for, that's what we were investigating. Kakati. So again, we have our plant extracts, it's the same picture. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to see, but we, we try to simulate the conditions inside the cell. Lastly, we presented the results the pharmacological studies on the plants mentioned by the healers showed so far. We tested all plant extracts and most of them were efficient. The limitations of in vitro studies were explained during the presentation of lab results, along with the explanation that follow-up studies were needed in the future, in order to fully verify the pharmacological effects in vivo and to assess the safety of the studied herbal drugs. That's me. That's Professor Gale. He's my boss. Agambatiabo. Day one afternoon, group discussion and questions from healers in the garden. Some of the healers wanted to know more about the testing methods and about what they can take from it when it comes to preparing their medicines. And I'm not a specialist on how to prepare the drug. I'm just a specialist in how to look into the plant pot and see what's in there. The way how to prepare it, it's your knowledge and you would, they should be confident in it. The questions from the healers focused on the limitations of science, the scope of laboratory experiments, regional differences in the concentrations of active ingredients in plants and even the role of spiritualism in traditional medicine. We can even tap on you, just as we are here, and tap on you, and for you, you get it. So that consciously, uh, this is the kind of thing. Okay, so that kind of spiritual <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. In essence, in essence, how would they come to know? Those who never went to school, maybe, yeah. but they are very particular about it. Yeah. That kind of thing is actually that. Yeah. Mm. I think that's... that's way distributed about amongst all traditional medicine. Somehow they know. Somehow and they know. I be, be coming in here like a foreigner, I will never learn. But they, they know and that's why we need to collaborate. Day two, all day, group visits to some of the healers' homes. During the group visits to the traditional healers' homes, they showed us how they find and harvest some of the forest plants investigated in the laboratory studies, how they process these plants, how they sell them on the market, and how they treat patients. 
The visits led to bidirectional communication, strengthening trust and interest in future collaborations. New research topics were identified via brainstorming methods, and traditional healers expressed their interest. <laughs> Within a wider frame, this study also addressed the open research movement and science communication strategies in general, because the workshop method is an example for science outreach. According to a study by Ayenga and Messe from 2019, gatekeeper actors are a critical factor regarding post-truth issues between researchers and the general public, because they tend to manipulate information for different motives. In this study, the authors conclude that a direct and constructive communication between the general public and scientists can avoid gatekeeper actors to occur and misinformation being spread. Moreover, another study by Dyer et al. concluded that direct contact with scientists is more likely to enable public outreach of higher quality when it comes to important issues. Thus, they presented a workshop where participants strongly requested to receive expert scientific feedback on their traditional practices, helped to circumvent the emergence of misperceptions of scientific knowledge and distrust in the scientific undertaking. Conducting a workshop for traditional healers and indigenous communities is an efficient way to transfer the results of ethnobotanical and ethnopharmacological studies back to local study participants. This video article showing a workshop along with visits to some of the healers' homes demonstrated a successful method of how bidirectional benefits and communication is possible as a starting point, fostering future scientific and community work collaborations. <laughs> And also to thank you for your, your interest in nature and the way it works. Of course, our approach and workshop concept may not be suitable for all local and indigenous people's cultural backgrounds or situations that may emerge during various aspects of ethnopharmacological research throughout the world. It is meant as an example and as always, scientists' individual approaches need to be adapted to the given circumstances. What remains a fact is that very few scientific findings are transferred back to the traditional healers and indigenous peoples who originally laid the foundation for the advanced ethnopharmacological research endeavors. For example, it is possible that subsequent laboratory studies could even reveal that some medicinal plants pose a threat to local communities because they are toxic and harmful to patients as a direct outcome of treatment. We believe that ethnopharmacologists should contribute to improving local herbal drug use, help reduce health hazards derived from medicinal plants, care and advocate for local communities and create and maintain good relationships for future collaborations. Consequently, we feel that ethnopharmacologists should commit to transferring the results of their studies back to their informants, for example, through medicinal plant workshops. Apart from that, the workshop method might also be regarded a valuable contribution to research on education, theory and science communication. <laughs>